Hello everybody, welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. Before we begin, I just want to say I hope you guys are all doing well, still nice and happy. So this is where something called the cross product comes into play. I want you guys to always think of 3D moments and cross product together. Now you guys say, all right, Clayton, cross product, 3D moments looking pretty good. Uh, but what is the cross product? Well, the cross product is defined as a vector A crossed by a vector B and the result is another vector. So there's going to be the first key thing here. The result is another vector. When you guys think a dot product, we took two vectors and we got a scalar. In the cross product, we take two vectors and we're getting another vector. But what exactly is this vector? Well, it's going to be called vector C and it's again simply denoted as vector A cross with vector B. It looks like a time sign and you guys can probably use a time sign. Everyone will know what exactly you're doing. Now, this resultant vector C has some very specific properties, which we're going to discuss right here. The first one is this. Let's say that vector A and vector B are in the xy plane. Now, you guys are saying, Clayton, why are you doing that? Well, it's going to become apparent really short, or really quickly, I guess. So the first thing is, if I were to take vector A and cross it with vector B, the resultant vector C is going to be perpendicular to both A and B. So your resultant vector, no matter what it is, a force vector, position vector, anything you want, it's always going to be perpendicular to the two input vectors. So in this particular case right here, if I cross A with B, I'm going to get a vector perpendicular to both. This is why I had A and B in the xy plane, because now I can say that my resultant vector A cross B, it's actually going to be in the uh, z direction, all right, and it's going downwards. So another thing is the direction of C follows the right-hand rule. So again, you guys may be looking at that and say, Clayton, why is it going downwards and not upwards? Well, this cross product follows the right-hand rule. So if I want to determine the direction of that vector, what I actually have to do is I have to go from A to B. So in this particular case, I go from A, I curl over to B, and as you can see, my finger is pointing downwards. Now, this is actually very important, and it leads to the next property where... Oh, I guess not quite the next property yet, but the next property we're going to talk about is the magnitude of this resultant is actually equal to the area formed by vector A and vector B. Now this isn't something you guys are going to know or something that you guys are really going to utilize, but it's going to make the proof that we present on the next page rather simple. So if we have vector A and vector B together and we cross them to get vector C, well the magnitude of C is actually going to be equal to the area of this parallelogram formed by A and B. Again, not something that we really use here in uh, engineering statics, but it's going to be important when I show you guys the proof, at least to help it make more sense to you guys. Now, I got ahead of myself, and the other property I want to talk about was this. Since the cross product follows the right-hand rule, it's very important the order of the vectors. So the cross product is not Commutative, I, I don't really know how to say that correctly. I'm going to be honest. Maybe you guys can correct me in the comments. But basically what this means is A cross B is not equal to B cross A. All right, so this is the one thing I really want you guys to remember. A cross B is not equal to B cross A. And again, it's because of the right-hand rule. Now, the vectors B cross A and A cross B, they're going to have the exact same components. They're just going to be in the opposite direction, okay? So that's what's going to happen. If you guys accidentally take the wrong vectors or do the order wrong, the components are going to stay the same, but all the components will have uh, the opposite sign of what they should actually have. So we can also do some fun things with the cross product, including scalar multiplication, as well as distribute it with some uh, vector addition. I'm not going to talk about those too much because I'm, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm not, the, I'm not the kind of guy that likes to show you all this fancy stuff and say, oh, you need to know it. I've never seen a case where you guys actually need to know this stuff. I'm just going to put it on there so you guys know, can be aware of it. But again, I've never seen it where you have to use it in this particular course. If there's one thing I want you guys to take away from this slide, it is this. A cross B is not equal to B cross A. The order of the cross product is going to be very important. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, we just talked about the cross product a lot, but you still haven't showed us how to calculate the damn thing. So let's go to the next slide and figure out how exactly do we calculate the cross product to get that result in vector C. Well, 
it's actually very nice and ugly at the same time. So the best way to show you guys the calculation is to show you guys the proof. So let's say that we have two vectors. We have vector A and vector B. And again, as you guys may guess, the goal is to cross them together to get vector C. So C is going to be equal to A cross B. Now, just like the dot product before, we're going to kind of take everything and multiply everything and we get this big ugly thing right here. Now in dot product, we would have i dot i, and we can say that that's equal to something. But in this particular case, we get a bunch of vectors cross each other. So I got i cross i, I got i cross j, et cetera, et cetera. Now, just like the dot product, we are going to solve this by figuring out what exactly each one of those things means. And this is why I listed some specific properties on the previous page. So let's go to 3D vector space where we have our x, y, and z. And one property which I kind of mentioned before in the dot product, and I'm going to mention it again here, but it's not something you need to know, is that i, j, and k, where we use in our Cartesian vector notation, they're actually vectors where i is equal to 1, 0, 0, j is equal to 0, 1, 0, and k is equal to 0, 0, 1. All right, they're actually vectors. And we can use those properties that we talked about on the previous page to make some nice simplifications. The first one is this, anything cross itself is going to be equal to zero. And this is why I told you that identity, that the resultant vector is actually the area of the parallelogram formed by two vectors. If the two vectors are the exact same, just like this, well, they create no area. So that's one of the reasons why I showed you guys, so that when it comes to this particular proof, you guys are saying, oh, okay, I understand why a vector cross itself is actually equal to zero. Now this doesn't do too much, but in our equation above, we can now cancel out three specific terms. You guys are saying, all right, all right, I see where this is going. It's going to cancel out and it's going to look pretty sexy. Well, not quite. It's going to look pretty sexy, but not a lot of things cancel out. In fact, these are the only things that cancel out. The rest just kind of simplify, but they don't cancel out. So the next thing is this. If we were to go around in a circle, and by a circle I mean i, j, k, that very specific order, i, j, k, i, j, k, i, j, k, that order matters. If we were to cross two vectors, we get the third one. So if I take i and cross it with j, I get k. And this is the property that if I were to cross two vectors together, the resultant vector is going to be perpendicular to both of them. So if I cross the x-axis with the y-axis, we know that the vector perpendicular to both of those axes is going to be the z-axis. That's why I got i cross j is equal to k. And I can keep going in this order and say that j cross k is equal to i, and k cross i is equal to j. Now this appears three times in our equation, so we're going to keep this in mind right here, and we're going to substitute it in a little bit later. Now, when I talked about this one, I said that the order is important. i, j, k, i, j, k, i, j, k. Now, if we were to go the opposite way and go kji, kji, we get this following thing, where j cross i is equal to negative k. It's the same reason as before, where the vector is going to be perpendicular, but the order of the vector matters because of the right-hand rule. So in the first case, we would go something like this, where it's pointed upwards, but in this case, we're going the opposite way, which is why it's simply going to be negative. So this also appears three times. So again, we can't cancel anything out but we can actually simplify it into the following, where c, which is equal to a cross b, is equal to the following. And as we can see, it's a vector with three components. Now, this goes back to what I said. When we do the cross product, our result is actually going to be a vector. It's not going to be a scalar like dot product. It's going to be a vector. And of course, it has three components. Now, you guys are looking at this and saying, <laughs> Clayton, this is ass, and I agree. This right here is not fun to memorize. I have a little trick, which I'm going to show you guys in the next slide, how I memorize it. Now, again, when I mention cross product, I want you guys to always remember 3D vectors. We haven't really talked about it yet, but cross product is heavily related to 3D vectors. And you guys are saying, OK, Clayton, if this is related to 3D vectors, and it's a formula that's given on my formula sheet, everything's looking pretty good. Yes and no. Nine times out of 10, when students make a mistake using cross product, it's this right here. As we can see, we have an I component and then we have a J component, but keep in mind that we have a negative sign in front of that J component. Students will always forget that negative sign. I promise you, always forget that negative sign and then they get their J component wrong. So when you guys are using this formula, keep in mind that there is a negative sign outside of that j component. If we look at the k component, it's still plus. 
but that J component has a negative sign, please don't forget that. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, I don't want to have to rely on a formula sheet. And I don't blame you. I hate formula sheets too. How can I memorize this formula? Well, I use something called the FISH method. And the FISH method is based on the idea that the cross product is simply the determinant of a matrix, specifically this matrix right here, where the first row is IJK, which we know. The second row is the components of vector A, and the third row is the components of vector B. Now, a lot of you guys are first years and may or may not have taken linear algebra. If you guys have taken linear algebra, you guys are laughing, saying, Clayton, I know the cross product. I know exactly what a determinant is. I'm doing pretty good, and that's great, so I'm, I'm happy for you. But unfortunately, a lot of first years don't take linear algebra before this course. So in this case, you guys may not know what a determinant is, and that's okay. I'm not going to teach you what a determinant is. It's something you guys can uh, explore later. It might make you a little bit sad because it's just gross math. But we can actually write this in a very specific way. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it like this because this is how I'm going to show you guys my own little fish method. Now you guys are saying fish method, this sounds like a joke. Well, yes, it's, it's kind of a joke. It's a, it's a trolley method, but it works, right? Trolley method, but it works. So writing the cross product in this specific way where I have it as basically three rows and three columns allows me to use my fish method. Now it has some specific steps. So if I want to take uh, A and cross it with B, I'm going to follow these steps. The first one is I'm going to cross out the column of interest. And by that I mean this, C is a vector. It's going to have three components. It's going to have an I, a J, and a K. So if I'm interested in the I component, I, I am going to cross out that I column. All right, so that's going to be my first step. The second step is I'm going to draw a fish on the uncrossed values. All right, I'm going to draw a fish on the uncrossed values. Now, this is when you guys are saying Clayton's losing his mind. What does he mean? Well, if I cross out AX and BX, my uncrossed values are simply AY, AZ, BY, and BZ. And I'm going to draw a fish. So it's going to look something like this. And don't judge me. This was the best I can do in PowerPoint drawing a fish. But it's going to look something like this. Now, I can determine the calculation of that component based on the path of the fish. Notice how I don't have the formulas on screen yet. But if I were to go through the fish, I start at AY in the top left, and I go down to BZ. So we're going to go AY times BZ. Now when I flip up, I'm going to have the negative sign. So we're going to go AY times BZ minus AZ times BY. And if I were to look at my formula, that's exactly what we have. So again, we're just drawing a fish. AY times BZ minus AZ times BY. And that's going to be my I component. After we find the I component, we simply repeat this method for the other components. So we're saying, all right, we got I, we're looking good. How about J? Well, again, if I'm interested in J, I'm going to cross out that J column, and I'm going to look at the uncrossed values. From there, I'm simply going to draw my fish and trace the path of the fish. So of course, we go AX down to BZ, so AX times BZ minus AZ times BX. Again, I just drew a fish, and that's going to be my J component. Again, AX times BZ minus AZ times BX. And then finally, I can repeat this for the K column where I'm going to draw my fish. I go AX times BY minus AY times BX. So if you guys start to remember the fish method, it's pretty easy. Now, if we look here, this is a very nice method. It allows us to calculate everything we want. Again, one trick. Don't forget the negative sign on that J component. That will get 9 out of 10 students on a midterm and I feel so bad because I got to dock some marks and then they get upset with me. And I don't want you guys to be upset with me. I want to, I want you guys to all be happy. So again, please don't forget that negative sign. All right. So that's going to be the cross product. And again, I said the cross product is related to moments in 3D. So yeah, that's it for this video. I want to thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video.